well. So what we do in my research group is we're really interested in assembling these little bitty tiny nano building blocks into bigger things. You can think of it like taking Legos and assembling them, except that ones I'm talking about are about a nanometer to a few hundred nanometers in size. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But what I've always been interested in ever since I got my bachelor's degree was how the chemical structure of something and then how it's microstructure in a fluid combined with how you process it, the temperature, the shear, the pressure, all those things result in properties. I mean, my first job, I worked on a plastic called polypropylene. Well, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of polypropylene. You only see one number on the bottom of the bottle, but there's a whole bunch of different things. So why is it you can take one basic polymer and make a carpet fiber or a baby diaper or a coat hanger or a lunchbox? That's what I was interested in very early on in my career as an interest that continues now that I'm a professor working in nanotechnology. <laughs> now, all our materials are dispersed in fluids, so I look at how they flow. So rheology is the study of how things flow and how they look or morphology. Now, because my research is basic, I'm able to work in a lot of different areas with a lot of different applications. So my research group has done everything from antimicrobial materials to a whole range of synthetic and, and biological nanocomposites. And then what I'm going to talk about today is liquid crystal and self-assembly and flow alignment of nanocylinders are little bitty nano-sized cylindrical building, building blocks. All right, now, before we talk more about the specifics, I want to talk about what nanotechnology is because it's a word that you've probably all heard, uh, probably in science fiction, if nothing else, and there's a lot of misconceptions out there. So first of all, does anybody in this room not have DNA in their body? <laughs> okay, good. So you're all, you're all human, that's good. Um, now, that means that you are all comprised of nanomaterials. Okay, DNA is a nanomaterial, it's a natural nanomaterial. Abalone seashells contain natural nanomaterials. The lizards and geckos that we're starting to see run around now, the hairs on their feet are nanoscale size, which enables the van der Waals forces of attraction to add up and enables them to climb the walls. So those are all nanomaterials. So nanotechnology is not just a new thing. Even in the synthetic side, it's not new. Now, these are the Damascus swords, the sharpest, most durable swords ever invented. People always wondered why. Well, thanks to electron microscopes and other modern tools, we now know. They contain something called single-walled carbon nanotubes, which until a few years ago we all thought were discovered in 1991. <laughs> now, the sword makers did not know they were making carbon nanotubes. The medieval artisans who made those beautiful stained glass windows did not know that they needed nano gold to get red and nano silver to get yellow. They didn't know chemistry, they didn't know atoms, they didn't know molecules. What they knew is if I take this and I heat it and I mix it in this way, this is what I get. Well now, thanks to our modern understanding, which is always evolving, and our modern tools, which are also always evolving, we can work with nanomaterials in a controlled way to get specific applications. Like if we just take a car, we've got nanomaterials in the paint to make it scratch resistant, We've got nanomaterials in the bumper to make it lightweight and impact resistant. We've got nanoclays in the fan housings to make them lightweight and temperature resistant. There's all kinds of nanomaterials in sporting goods, <coughs> cosmetics, electronics, and things like flexible solar arrays. So nanotechnology is not new, and it is everywhere. So while there's a lot of fun science fiction out there, the next time someone tells you to be afraid of nanomaterials, just realize that they're talking about your own DNA. Okay, so I want to go back to the tree theme. So if we think of a tree being in the scale of meters, so a meter's only about three feet high, so many meters, unless it's one of the baby ones Lisa talked about. And then we look at maybe the transverse section. Well, now we're in the centimeter scale. If we scale it down more and look at the growth rings, now we're in the millimeter scale. The cellular structure goes down to the 500 micron scale. We're still not down to nano. But when we start looking inside that cellular structure and then down to the fibril matrix structure that makes up those materials, those are about 300 nanometers. But within those microfibrils are nanomaterials, so things that are even smaller. Even small building blocks inside of bigger building blocks is how nature works. Now what I'm interested in is the crystalline part of those nanomaterials. So we can think of it like building blocks. So here is my amorphous, these squiggly things, 
and my crystalline parts of my cellulose microfibrils with a process called acid hydrolysis, industrial plants um, and a USDA forest product plant can make a whole bunch of nanomaterials out of them. Now, because they are so tiny, we don't need to take a whole tree. We can take waste from other processes and use them. And the result is these crystalline cellulose building blocks. They're about 107 nanometers long or nine nanometers wide. Now, if you still don't know what a nanometer is, look at it this way. If you put a big spoonful of sugar in your coffee or tea, that's not a nanometer. One crystal, still not a nanometer. One molecule of sugar inside that crystal, that's a nanometer. Now, so now we've got manufacturing plants, one of them's right outside of Atlanta, making a whole bunch of these cellulose nanocrystals. Well, what do you do with them? You've got a big pile of building blocks. What do you do? Well, what we do in my group is we use thermodynamics to do most of the work. We put them in a solution or a dispersion, and we know from thermodynamics that if we can get them to a high enough concentration, they have to line up. And if we can get them to line up, we can get cool properties. The fundamental basis for most of our research comes from this 1990, 1949 paper by a guy named Onziger. Now, we're not going to go through all the math. This isn't that class. <laughs> it's a general lecture. But we're going to talk about what generally happens. So if you have two rods, two sticks, and they're in a solution, they can wander around and rotate and translate, and they'll never see each other until they get more concentrated. And then, well, they're not going to be able to rotate without hitting each other, but they can still move around a lot. And then, if you imagine they get more and more concentrated, well, they'll barely be able to wiggle. Be like getting on the train in the Atlanta airport at a peak time, right? You, you can't really move. Everybody's sort of lined up pointing the same direction, but you can't really move. But if you go to even higher concentration, things have to start aligning. And if you go to higher concentration still, they have to start pointing in the same direction. Now, it's not perfect. And thermodynamics doesn't have a time scale, so the time scale might be way too slow for an industrial process, but we can help it along. Um, if you still aren't sure what I'm talking about, it's amazing. Five-year-olds understand this instantaneously. PhDs, it takes a while. <laughs> Grad students and undergrads, you're probably somewhere in between. I bet most of the undergrads have it already. Okay, so let's say you got to take pencils and put them in a box. The first pencil goes anywhere. The second pencil goes almost anywhere. If you want to get all the pencils in the box, what has to happen? They have to line up. Now, there's a lot of equations and thermodynamics behind it, but in essence, it really is that simple. Now, the way these little big nano building blocks and trees line up, as well as your own DNA, at high concentration is they form this twisted structure, where this is called the pitch. So initially, they're pointed this way, and then they rotate a little bit, and it takes this leak called the pitch to rotate all the way around. Now, this uh, pitch results in the structure generated here, which is a cross-polarized optical microscope image that gives you a very characteristic pattern that actually coincidentally looks a little bit like a tr tree ring, but is called a fingerprint structure. Now, what we do in, in my lab, and this slide was actually made by a Partha who's in the room, is we use shear to line everything up. This is our lab scale shear. In industry, you'd have a big film line that's many feet wide and going, you know, many feet a second and wrapping up onto rolls, but this is our little lab scale thing. And you can see that after shear, the color is more uniform. The more uniform the color, the more lined up they are. So we can tell what's going on with the nanomaterial by just looking at the color under cross-polarized optical microscopy. Now, we also know that this cholesteric ordering is found in nature. So sometimes you want to al align everything, Sometimes you want to keep it. So the beetle is one of the better studied uh, creatures in terms of cholesteric ordering of its chitin. And this greenish area has a pitch of 307 nanometers. And the reddish area has a pitch of 310 nanometers. So this is something that nature already knows how to do. And as engineers and scientists, we're learning. But what we do know is that the wavelength of light of maximum reflection is equal to the refractive index times the pitch. So now we can control color by controlling how these materials organize. And we do a lot of imaging using a cross-polarized optical microscope. And the way that works is if you ever took your sunglasses and broke them, and you rotated them 90 degrees, no light would come through unless you put a birefringent material in the middle. And that's what these samples are. Because what it does is it breaks the light into two different rays, and then you get recombined. And that's what results in these colors. So this is what we do a lot of. Now, it's nice because it's great scientific data, 
but it's also very uh, attractive and pretty. So we, we also do some art on the side. Now, we also look at how things flow. So this is viscosity or the resistance to flow versus the shear rate. And you can see for this liquid crystal and uh, cellulose nanocrystal solution, it comes down, it levels off, and then it comes down some more. Well, by looking at the microscope images, we can see initially it's this mottled blue, so not too organized, maybe a little bit. And then it gets brown, then it kind of stays brown, and gets more organized blue, then green and green, and very uniform green. So this is because the rods are aligning with shear. The shear is helping coax everything to line up the way it should. Now, from physics and something called the michel Leve chart, you can just look at the chart. As long as your thickness is constant, you can tell how much more you've aligned things. No electron microscopes needed. Now, we looked at this, and my student Zan Haywood did this for different concentrations. So the black part means no alignment. So there's some aligned and not aligned regions. This would be biphasic. And higher concentrations, and then how shear affected it. So this is very organized and ordered, and this retains that kind of twisted structure we were talking about. And for different applications, we want different things. So it's very important to know how to control the structure. But since we want solid materials, even though we're starting with a liquid, we need to know what happens during drying. So we can monitor that. Uh, so this is three different dispersions of different concentration by looking at the color change over time and also the change in that optical contrast. So lower numbers means less organized. So for the low concentration materials, it have, goes very fast. For the medium ones, it goes a little slower. For the higher ones, it's pretty much stagnant. So we then take our final film materials and analyze what we see in terms of the spectra. Here, this is uh, in transmittance and not reflectance. But we can see how the different films have different peak wavelengths. And this was done on a Crake microspectrophotometer. <coughs> so these films that we're making out of little bitty building blocks from trees have a lot of cool applications. One that a lot of people have looked at is anti-counterfeiting coatings. Structural color can't be reproduced. It can't be copied. And these fingerprint structures can be unique. And under different light, you'll see different things. So you can maybe have a passport or something else that has something similar to this built in. Uh, what we're really interested in in my group is color filters and polarizers based on light reflection, not light absorption. You may not know this, but your big old flat screen TV, only about 10% of the energy you're putting in the back is coming out the front. Because every color and optical element it goes through is absorbing the light. Now modern TVs are getting more and more efficient and starting to use this idea of what's called light recycling where instead of having the color elements absorb the light the way they traditionally do, 3M and others have worked on ways to have it reflect back and recombine. So these are some of the things we can do with the films, but I want to talk about one other thing we can do with these films, and that is that we can make MIMS. Now, what are MIMS, you might ask? Well, MIMS are officially microelectromechanical systems. that are complex structures used in sensing and actuation on a micrometer scale. So on the scale between the nanoscale and the big human scale. And this is an example of a complex MIMS made by Sandia National Labs. This is simply a cantilever beam. Well, MIMS, you may not have ever heard of them, but you use them all the time. Uh, they're actually a $16 billion industry for silicon-based MIMS in the US alone. So your inkjet printers, that projector screen, this microphone, your touch screens, your airbags in your car, they all contain these MIMS. And most of them are made out of silicon. What we have shown, after a lot of work, is that we can make them out of these nanocrystalline tree building blocks. Now, why would we want to do that? So this is a, a mask and a wafer. Well, it's biodegradable and renewable. The silicon materials have a lot of strengths, but they have a lot of drawbacks. To process them, you need hours of 1,000 degrees temperature. Partha here has shown you can make them out of cellulose at about 60 degrees C, much more quickly. Good energy savings. So green material, green processing. We don't need hazardous solvents like hydrofluoric acid. We start with water and maybe use things you might find at home, acetone and isopropanol. Easier surface functionalization, which is very important for biomedical testing, which is a huge growth area. And we can control the properties because we're assembling these blocks from the bottom up instead of just etching a material from the top down. So in conclusion, I gave you a lot of information, but there's a few things I want you to take away. First of all, nanotechnology has always been here. 
It's always existed. It's just we're gaining a better understanding through our modern scientific knowledge and tools, which is always evolving. Secondly, the principles of thermodynamics enable ranging nanomaterials into larger structures, as well as a lot of other things. If you've ever seen the quote on the front of Ross Hall, it says, chemistry leads man into the domain of those latent forces whose power controls the whole material world. That quote is referring to thermodynamics. Cellulose nanocrystals can be extracted from waste biomass and assembled into larger structures for engineering applications. This could include optical films for security devices or lower energy displays, and also a new greener alternative for the rapidly growing MIMS industry. So I'd like to acknowledge my, my research group, Partha and Zan, did most of the work that I talked about today. Uh, Dr. Hamilton's research group, uh, the National Science Foundation for Funding, and the Auburn IGP program for our Crake uh, microspectrophotometer.